Okay, class. Um, today we're going to look at limit laws, but before I do that, I'm going to introduce some patterns or some, uh, some facts, I'm going to call them. Okay. So the first thing is, is that any power of X, if I have any power of X where N is an integer or a, a positive whole non-negative whole number, okay? That the limit as x approaches a of f of that x will always just be the limit as x approaches a of x to the n will just be a to the n. Okay, we can do a direct substitution. The reason for that, folks, is that any power of x is a function that has no this function, x to the first, x to the second, x to the third, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, all those basic polynomial functions, there are no jumps or holes or asymptotes. Okay, so that means that the value of the limit is just going to literally be the value of the function at that point. So you can literally just do what's called direct substitution to find the limit as x approaches that. You can literally just directly substitute it right in for x. Okay, we call that direct substitution. The same is going to be true for f of x equaling cos x or sine x or e to the x any of those functions, because those have the same property as your basic x squared, x cubed, x third, x to the fourth functions. They don't have any jumps, they don't have any holes, and they don't have any asymptotes, which are the only places we're going to have weird stuff happening with limits. So basically, if I'm taking the limit as x tends to a of cos x, then that's just going to be whatever cosine of a is. Same thing if I put a sine x there. I could have limit as x approaches a of sine x would be sine a. Limit as x approaches a of e to the x would be e to the a. Okay, so we're going to use this fact in today's lecture, okay, for some of the problems that we're going to do. For some of the problems that we're going to do. So we're going to now go, scroll down and look at limit laws, okay? So here's our limit laws. If I have two functions, f of x and g of x, those functions could be things like I just described, like an x cubed function or a sine function um, or a cosine function or an e to the x function. It could be any of those. They're defined for some open interval containing a and assuming l and m are the real numbers such that, so what's basically happening is if I take the limit as x approaches a of one of the functions and I get l and I take the limit as x approaches that same a of another function and I get m, so as long as these two functions exist and are not infinite, and then we're going to add in that we're going to allow a constant to exist, C, then each of the statements are true. Well, if I take the limit of the sum of those two functions, so for example, if I had like x cubed plus 3x, or sorry, my bad, x cubed plus x, those are like the functions I talked about before, x to the n functions then basically I can just evaluate the limit at x cubed and the limit at x separately and then add them when I'm done. So essentially what that means, guys, is that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. And we can find those individual limits based upon what I just said by direct substitution. We can just put in a for x in both of those and that would give me my limit L and my limit M. We just add them. You'll see how this works more tangibly when we get less abstract here, okay? Same thing with the difference. The limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. And of course, those two limits would be L and M because we define them in the text above as having that. If I have a limit of a constant times a function, I can bring the constant out in front of the limit constant out front and just take the limit of the function itself and then multiply by the constant when I'm done taking that limit. Limit of the product is the product of the limits. 
Limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. The limit of a function raised to a power is the same as if I brought the limit inside the power, took it first, and then raised it to the power. That's what the L to the N is there. And the same thing with a root. The limit of a root of a function is the same as taking the limit inside the function first and then doing the root after you've already found that limit. So let's look at a really simple example for that. Um, the way I would break this one up is using limit laws, since we know we have basically we have subtraction, addition, we've got a constant multiplied by a function x squared, and then we've got the the fraction bar is really division, isn't it? And then we've got another addition on the bottom. So using limit laws, I can break this up, okay, to the following. I can say that this is equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x squared minus, using limit laws, using the subtraction limit law, limit as x approaches 2 of 3x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 1. So I use the addition and subtraction limit laws in the numerator. Now I'm going to use the division limit law. And so this should be the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed plus the limit addition law as x approaches 2 of 4. And I use the division law there for the fraction bar. Now I can actually pull this 2 out front using the constant law up above, which would be this law up here. If I have a constant multiplied by function, I can bring the constant outside the limit. So that would give me 2 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus, I'm going to do the same thing by bringing the 3 out front here because it's a constant multiplied by the function x. Limit as x approaches 2 with 3 out front of x. And then I'm just going to leave the rest alone. Limit as x approaches 2 of 1, all divided by the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 4. Well, this is equal to... <clears throat> now, because this is a limit as x approaches 2 of x squared, I can use direct substitution as I outlined in the previous slide. Um, we can just literally put in 2 for x squared, so that'd be 2 times 2 squared, which would be 2 times 4, which is 8. And then this would be 3 times, plug in the 2 for the x, because we established already there's no jumps or anything in the function y equal x. So this would be 3 times 2, which is 6, plus the limit as x approaches 2 of just the constant 1 is just 1. Then on the bottom, I put in 2 for x here, direct substitution, because that's an x to the n function. So that's 8. Plus x approaches 2 of the constant 4 is just 4, because that's constant. It's always 4. So now this is x minus 6 is 2, plus 1 is 3, over 12, so 3 twelfths, which is 1 fourth. So that limit ends up equaling 1 fourth using the limit loss. Now you may no have noticed a, a shortcut that's going to kind of happen here, and that's what this theorem's about. This theorem basically says, folks, that if... If the function we're looking at, the overall function we're taking a limit of, is either a polynomial or a rational expression, which is a quotient of two polynomials or two polynomials divided, then we can pretty much do direct substitution from the very beginning using the limit laws. The limit laws basically prove this idea because all a polynomial is is a sum of terms that we can do direct substitution on anyway using limit laws. And a quotient is really two polynomials that we can do direct substitution on. And we can do direct substitution because of the division, the fraction bar, which is really just division, which is also another limit law. And so that means that we can do direct substitution on any polynomial or rational expression as long as we don't get a zero denominator. If we get a zero denominator, uh, we're disqualified 
because we can't divide by zero because we're not going to actually get a value out. We're not, we're not going to get a limit, uh, a concrete value. You could get a zero over zero for this, or you could get a constant over a zero. And we're going to look at how to handle both of these in the next several problems after this. But for now, we're just going to try direct substitution on this and see what happens. So what happens if I do direct substitution, plugging the negative 2 in for the x? Then I would get 3. Let's just see what happens. Minus 2 times negative 2 plus 7. It's going to work. That's why I put the equal sign. So this will be 3 times negative 2 cubed is negative 8. So that's negative 24 plus 4 plus 7. That's negative 20 plus 7 is negative 13. Okay, so that works. Um, and then if I put in 1, I'm clearly not going to get 0 in the denominator, so I can do direct substitution on this by the theorem above. So that would be 2 minus 7 over 1 plus 6, which is negative 5 sevenths. That's what I will get for that one. All right. Now, moving on. This one's actually quite similar. It turns out, I, I, I already said above in that first slide before we kind of came into the limit laws, that sine and cosine, you can do direct substitution with sine and cosine for any x as well. So that theorem above doesn't technically apply to this one because although this is a polynomial, a constant is still a polynomial, this is not actually a polynomial. But we can still do direct substitution on this or use limit laws. So if I wanted to use limit laws, I could I could do it the long way. This would be the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 plus sine x. And then on the bottom, I can further break that up. The top will just stay the limit as x approaches 0 of 1. The bottom, I can break up into 2 using the sum limit law. That would be the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 plus the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x. Okay. Well, the limit as x approaches 0 of the constant 1 is just 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of the constant 1 is also 1. And then the limit as x approaches 0 is sine x. I can do direct substitution because of what I said in the first slide. There's no jumps, there's no holes, and there's no asymptotes for sine. So that means if I approach any point from the left and the right, of say zero in this case, I'm going to get just the value of the function, whatever it is at that point, because there's no jumps, there's no holes. So that would be zero. So I get one over one plus zero, which is one. So that limit equals one. Moving on, what happens if we get an indeterminate form of zero over zero? Well, we just talked about an example where the direct substitution um, using the limit and the limit laws, we end up getting numerical answers um, when we plug them into the rational expression. In both cases, we got a numerical answer. We didn't get a 0 over 0, which is an undefined, or a constant over 0 situation, which is also undefined. So the first undefined case is the 0 over 0 case. That's the one we're going to handle first. So what we need to do is we first make sure that our function as the appropriate form cannot be evaluated immediately using limit laws. So if I stick in negative 3 to this numerator on this first problem, the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared plus 4x plus 3 all over x squared minus 9. If I stick in negative 3 to the top and bottom of that, I will get 0 over 0. Okay, That's a problem. And so we need to do something to this function to get it to be equivalent. Well, I want to point out that I can factor the numerator and denominator of this to get x plus 3 times x plus 1 in the numerator, if I factor x squared plus 4, x plus 3. And in the bottom, if I factor x squared plus 9, I would get x plus 3 times x minus 3, OK? And that is the exact same function of what I have in there. If I cancel the x plus 3s, OK, I get x plus 1 over x minus 3. Now, if you remember your pre-calc, this function, the red one here, and the green one I just found, which is algebraically equivalent to it, they are almost exactly the same function. The difference between the two functions, they look exactly the same. They have the same curvature, and they're literally the exact same 
function except for the red function has a hole at x equals negative 3, and this function, the green function, has no hole. Okay? Both, cur both functions, no hole at x equals negative 3. Okay? Both functions, however, have an asymptote at x equal 3. Okay? But we're not looking at x equals 3. We're not evaluating this function this limit at x equals 3. We're evaluating it at x equals negative 3. So the red function has a hole at x equals negative 3, and the green function has no hole at x equals negative 3, but the graphs look identical to each other except for that one point where there's a hole. It's important to note that a hole, where there's a hole, a simple hole like that, and not a jump or an asymptote, the limit will be the same for the red function and the green function. The limit should be the same because a hole... If I have a hole in a graph, if I just create a random curve, if I have a hole in a graph, and then I were to create an equivalent curve, the exact same curve, that has no hole, it's important to notice that the limit approaches the same height at that point, whether there's a hole or not. Okay, so the reason I'm explaining all that is to help you to understand the idea that even though I did an algebraic simplification here, the limits will be the same even though one is a hole and one doesn't because the limit approaches the same height. So we can actually do this as x approaches negative 3. This, is, this original limit is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this new algebraically equivalent um, expression. And the nice thing about this algebraically equivalent expression is I can plug and do a direct substitution now, and I get negative 3 plus 1 on the top, which is negative 2, and I get negative, um, oh, I typoed that, my bad, that's a minus 3, and I get negative 6 on the bottom, okay, so I end up getting 1 third for that limit. So what I did there is I factored the top and the bottom, and I canceled a common factor, which doesn't change the limit at that point, but it does change the algebraic expression to an expression where I can do a direct substitution to find out what, that, what, what we're approaching at that point. Now, so that was part A. Um, we need to make sure as appropriate form, uh, step number two here, need to find a function that's equivalent to f of x over g of x over some interval containing a. To do this, we may need to try one of the following steps. Part a. If f and x are polynomials, we should factor each function and cancel out any common factors. So we just did part a. We just did an example that utilizes part a. Part b. If the numer numerator or denominator contains a difference involving a square root, we should try multiplying the numer numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the expression involving the square root. All right, what does that all mean? Well, there's a sneaky little algebraic trick that makes this possible. If I plug in negative 3 in, in this problem, limit as x approaches negative 3 of the square root of the quantity x plus 4 minus 1 all over the quantity x plus 3, if I stick in negative 3 for x on the top and bottom, I get 0 over 0. You can check it. All right. So what I do is I do this sneaky little trick. It's an algebraic trick that somebody figured out at some point in the history of humankind. And that sneaky little trick is to go ahead and multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. You're like, what's the conjugate? Well, the conjugate is the exact same expression as that square root of x plus 4 minus 1, except instead of a minus 1, we stick a plus 1. And we're going to multiply the top and bottom because if we multiply the top by a Anything, we have to multiply the bottom of the fraction by the same thing because we're really essentially multiplying by 1. This is just 1, and anytime we multiply anything by 1, it doesn't change its value. Okay, and on the top, I'm going to have to FOIL this sucker out. So I'm going to have to take, these are two binomials. I'm going to have to first take the square root of x plus 4 times the square root of x plus 4, which this should equal the limit as x approaches negative 3, of x plus 4, because the square root of x plus 4 times the square root of x plus 4 should just be x plus 4, then notice what's going to happen. I'm going to get 
the outer terms plus 1 times the square root of x plus 4 minus 1 times the square root of x plus 4. So the O and the I terms in the FOIL cancel each other out. And then I just get the last terms, negative 1 times 1, which gives me negative 1. So that's really simple. Whoops. And then the bottom I'm not going to FOIL out, and you'll see why. This is going to be a pattern. Just FOIL out the part with the square root. All right. Notice that this numerator now, x plus 4 minus 1, is really x plus 3. Okay. And I can actually cancel the x plus 3 here and the x plus 3 and put a 1 and a 1 there. So I end up with, this is the limit as x approaches negative 3 of 1 over the square root of x plus 4 plus 1. Now I can stick negative 3 in by direct substitution using the limit laws. We're using them. We're just doing it on the fly. So that's going to get me 1 over negative 3 plus 4 is really 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. So I just get 1 plus 1, so I get 1 half. So now we've used parts A and B. Now what if f of x over g of x is a complex fraction? Let's simplify it. So now we're going to get into some problems where we get into some weirder stuff. Okay, so here's a couple problems we're going to do. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. This one. So if I stick in negative 3 on the top and bottom for this one, the limit as x approaches negative 3 of 1 over the quantity x plus 2 plus 1 all over the quantity x plus 3, if I stick in negative 3, I do get 0 over 0 again. Okay, so now just do some simple algebra. Let's combine... Let's uh, clear out. Let's let's make this into a regular rational expression instead of a complex rational expression. The way we do that, if you remember your pre-calc, is we multiply the top and bottom by x plus two, and the reason we do that is because that clears out that denominator and the numerator, and we're really just multiplying by um, one, right? X plus two over x plus two is one. So this is going to give me the limit as x approaches negative three. The x plus 2 times the 1 over x plus 2 is just 1. And then the 1 times the x plus 2 is x plus 2. You see what's going to happen here. The bottom I'm not going to foil out. That's going to be a pattern. We don't need it like in the last problem. Well, this numerator is now x plus 3, right? And so again, we have a situation where this and this cancel, and it gives me a 1 and a 1. So now I'm left with the limit as x approaches negative 3 of 1 over x plus 2, which now I can use my limit laws and do direct substitution. That's going to give me 1 over negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1, so I get negative 1 is that limit. So you notice a pattern here, guys. We're trying to get this big mess to turn into a rational expression that we can then do some canceling and some direct substitution. Here's another one that's kind of you're going to run into. This one's a little bit different because this one, if I stick in three, I get a zero down here and a zero down here. So I basically get uh, a one over zero minus a four over zero, which is is, is just a total nonsense and a mess that we don't want to deal with, okay? So what we need to do is let's let's see if we can combine these using our knowledge of how to like combine fractions. In order to combine those, I probably let me erase some of this. I'm going to factor this denominator. This factors as x minus 3 times x plus 1. So you notice we can almost combine these two fractions. All I need to do is build up this one to have an x plus 1 factor. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this by x plus 1. Okay, I'm squeezing that in. So this is going to be the limit as x tends to 3 of x plus 1 over x minus 3 times x plus 1. Just built up that fraction by multiplying. And then this is going to be minus 4 over x plus 3. Whoops, it's x minus 3, my bad. 
x minus 3 times x plus 1. Now I can combine these because I have a common denominator. So this will be x plus 1 minus 4. x plus 1 minus 4 is actually x minus 3. And then over x minus 3 times x plus 1, the common denominator. Notice again, these cancel conveniently, giving me a 1 and a 1. And so I end up with the limit as x tends to 3 of 1 over x plus 1. Now I put in, I can use my limit laws and do direct substitution on that polynomial or that rational expression, and I get 1 over 4. So we use three basic techniques there, guys. If they give you a rational expression and it's a 0 over 0, try to factor and cancel and then retry your direct substitution again. And then if they give you a complex rational expression, turn it in to a rational expression. Turn it into a rational expression. See if any canceling happens and allows you to attempt direct substitution again, which is based upon limit laws. And then if they give you a weird fraction expression like this, go ahead and do some algebra to combine it again to a rational expression that might have some canceling and allow for direct substitution. So in all three of these examples, we're trying to get a, a single rational expression that we may end up doing some canceling, uh, where, we, where, where we will likely end up doing some canceling and then attempt direct substitution again. And again, to review, the reason why the canceling does not affect the limit is because canceling out a factor, all it does is make a hole vanish from the, the, res, the graph. And a hole being gone does not affect what, what the limit value is at that point. The, the point at the hole being gone, rather. So this is just another example of one like we just did. You can kind of look through it where they, they built up the fractions, okay, and they combined them and then the x is canceled, and then they went ahead and, you know, did the direct substitution again and got an answer. So this is very similar to the last one. You can kind of look over that, pause if you want. It's another example of that type of problem. Now, how do we evaluate a two-sided limit using limit laws? Well, it's exactly the same. The only difference is, is that this is a piecewise function. So um, if I drew the number line, if I drew a number line here quick, I'm going to draw a number line right here. And there's a change of this function's definition at x equals 2. Okay, So if you look at for x less than 2, so if I like stuck an open hole here and went like that, and then x greater than or equal to 2, closed hole, we have two different definitions of the function. So when x is less than 2, we define the function as 4x minus 2. When f is, x is, I think I said f, when x is less than 2, and I just did a typo on that too, it's, it's 3. So that should be 3. Whoops, I just, 3. And when x is greater than or equal to 2, which is the other half of the number line, then the function value is x minus 3 squared. So we have two different definitions. So if I want to do part A, let's zoom out just a hair to make some room here. If I want to do part A, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, okay, I'm coming from this side right here, I will use the 4x minus 3 definition of the function because I'm coming from that side. Well, that 4x minus 3, if I, I, that's a polynomial which I can do dis, direct substitution on. So I'm going to do, I'm going to use the 4x minus 3 function first. Whoops, let me, let me show all the work for that. Sorry. So f of x would be the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of 4x minus 3, which will then in turn do a direct substitution. That'll be 8 minus 3, which will be 5. Okay, now if part B, if I want to take the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x, 
that's the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. And I'm going to use now, since I'm coming from the right-hand side here, up in the picture there, that's going to be, I'm going to use the x minus 3 squared part of the function. That's going to be 2 minus 3, which is negative 1 squared, which is 1. Okay, And so that tells me that the limit as x approaches 2 in general of the function is does not exist because the limit on the right and the left are not equal. Okay, so that's how you evaluate the left and the right hand side limit. You just have to use the rules on the left and the right as you approach from the left and the right. All right, let's move forward a little bit here. Now, so that's how we handle the zero over zero case with the three different possibilities that could come up. Um, that's how we handle left and right hand side of limit. How do we handle um, how do we handle it when we get a constant over a zero? So in this example, limit as x approaches one of the quantity x plus two all over the quantity x minus one squared. Well, we get on the top of this, we're going to get three, and on the bottom of this, we're going to get zero. All right, so we need to figure out how we're going to evaluate this. Well, we've already talked about in previous sections that when we get the constant over zero case, okay, that it's either going to go to positive infinity or negative infinity. So all we need to do, folks, is figure out which of those ones it goes to. But we're going to have to check it from the left and the right because we need to make sure that the left and the right hand side agree. So we're going to go ahead and take the limit as x goes to 1 from the left. We're going to start with this one. Okay, we're going to start with that. So all I need to do is take a test point to the left. So a test point. And we're going to use x equals 0 0.9. Just pick a number close to, the, close to 1 on the left side of 1 on the number line. And put it in there. Well, that's going to give me, um, in the top, it's going to give me an estimate of 2.9 over negative 0 0.1 squared. And we notice that that's going to be a positive number, isn't it? Because this is squared. When we square the negative, it gives me a positive. So that tells me that this is going to be positive infinity because we know that the numbers are going to be positive as we get closer and closer to one from the left-hand side on the number line. Okay, so that's part one. Let's do part number two. Let's take the limit as x approaches one from the right of x plus two over x minus one squared. Just do a test point to find out the sign. We already know it's going to go to positive. Whoops, I didn't write a negative infinity up here. Sorry, my bad. We already know it's going to go to positive or negative infinity. So we just got to figure out which it's going to. We don't need to know. So so I'm going to try a point just to the right of two of 1, which would be, say, 1.1. 1 .1. And that's going to give me uh, 3.1 over 1, uh, 0 0.1. When I do 1.1 minus 1, I get 0 0.1 squared, which that's going to definitely be positive. So this is also going to positive infinity. So that tells me that the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 2 over x minus 1 squared is going to equal positive infinity because it's an infinite limit because um, both of these agree. All right? So that's really important. Now, how could these have disagreed? Well, one way they could have disagreed, if you had noticed, I'm going to kind of edit this a little bit, is if I change this to a 3, watch what happens. If this is a 3, and I use 0.9, and this is a 3, then this becomes a minus. So this becomes a minus infinity. We follow the green work all the way through. And if I change this to a 3... And then I change this to a 3. 
this stays a plus. 3.1 over positive 0.1 cubed is plus. So this is positive infinity. So then that would be a does not exist at that point. We wouldn't specify it a positive or negative infinity because these two up here don't agree. So basically, if that power is even, then we're going to get two positive infinity results from the left and the right. If that power is odd, we'd get a positive infinity and a negative infinity from the left and the right. And we'd end up having a does not exist and wouldn't be able to specify to an infinity or negative infinity. All right. Let's do the last topic for the day. day sorry, it's daytime. Um, this is called the squeeze theorem. Let's introduce it. Let's say I give you three functions, f, g, and h. Um, and they're all defined for some interval around a. a is right here on the graph. And they tell us that g is squeezed between h and f. That means it's always, in, from a pictorial standpoint, um, G is always above F, which you can see it's always above F there on the graph, and it's always below H or equal to H. It could be above or equal to or below or equal to to those two functions respectively. Let's say we also know that as H and F both approach A, they both approach the same limit, which would be, they don't, they don't write the limit in there, but that limit right here at A, That limit would be L right there. That's the height. Well, if you know both of those things, then it's absolutely guaranteed just by common sense that the limit as X approaches A of G of X also has to be L. And the reason we know that is because we've already said that G of X is squeezed between H and F. So there's nowhere for it to go. If H and F meet at that point as far as a limit goes, then G has to meet at that point too because otherwise G would have to either be above H or below F. All right, so that's the squeeze theorem. So how do we use the squeeze theorem in actual algebraic application? Um, so if I want to use the squeeze theorem to evaluate this, well, for trig functions, we have a special relationship, right? For any trig function, sine, not any trig function, for sine of anything or cosine of anything. Both of those are always less than or equal to 1, and they're always bigger than or equal to negative 1. And that hinges upon the idea that both of them have a periodic form. You should remember this. I shouldn't have to. Sine function looks like this. And the cosine function looks like that. Whoops. And so on and so forth. So you guys know that. So all we'll do is I'll just draw the sine one for now because I'm having trouble. My thing is lagging a little bit. So, but anyway, the sine function looks like that, and the cosine function, and the height of those two graphs is, is goes to a maximum of one and to a minimum of minus one. Okay. So that's just a little factoid we need to remember with these. So we're going to use this fact in a lot of these problems. So what does that mean for us here? That means that I can create some inequalities here. So let's start with the first inequality. You guys would agree with me that that first, I'm going to build this function under here. Here's how I'm going to build it. Sine of 1 over x is definitely less than or equal to 1 and bigger than or equal to negative 1. Because the sine of anything is below 1 and above negative 1. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply every term in this equation by x squared in this inequality. It's not an equation. My bad. That's legal because, remember, we can multiply the left and right-hand side of an inequality by the same thing. The only time we run into a problem is if the thing we're multiplying by on each side is a negative because if we multiply both sides of an inequality by a negative, we would have to flip this sign. But we know that x squared is never going to be negative. It's always going to be positive because whenever we square something, we get a positive. So now I have a new inequality, which would be this. Negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared sine 
1 over x, which is less than or equal to x squared. Okay, now this looks an awful lot, okay, like our squeeze theorem, if you can see that, where we have one function less than another one less than another one. And so in this formulation here, this is my f, this is my g function, and this is my h function. And it's it works out really nice because my g function is the function in here. That's how I decided how I built that. Is I started with the sine 1 over x being less than or equal to 1 and greater than or equal to negative 1. Then I multiply by the x squared because I want it to look like this function here. Because now I've got some squeeze theorem magic. Because I know that I know that the limit as x approaches 0 of f, which is minus x squared, and the limit as x approaches 0 of h, which is x squared, I know that both of those equal l, sorry, equals 0. Direct substitution, right? Just direct substitution, they're polynomials. So since I know that the function I'm looking at is squeezed between those two functions by inequality, and I know that the limits of the two outer functions, f and h, at 0 are 0, I know by squeeze theorem. Therefore, by squeeze theorem, the limit as x tends to 0 of x squared sine 1 over x has to also be 0 because both of these functions go to 0. Go to 0. And I know that the function I'm looking at is squeezed between them for all x's. That means that the limit as x goes to 0 of that function also has to be 0. Okay? So that's how we would use the squeeze theorem. So what's going to be, what's going to happen in your squeeze theorem problems, guys, a lot, is you're going to have a trig function. Um, or you might have an exponential function. You'll have to be a little creative with that one. But... And you're going to set your trig function to be less than or equal to 1 and greater than or equal to negative 1. Then you're going to multiply or divide by whatever you have here um, to get it to the inside here to look like the g function. And then you're just going to evaluate the limit on the two sides, outsides. And once you evaluate the limit on the two outsides, if those are equal, you know that the limit of the thing inside also has to be equal because that function is squeezed between them. All right. Very last thing. Uh, just an important trig limit you're going to need to know. There's two of them you're going to need to know. I'm going to state one of them that's not here right now that you need to know. And that is an important trig limit uh, besides the one that is here. Is that the limit as theta approaches 0 of sine theta over theta, that equals 1. Okay, so you're going to need to know that one. Okay. Just memorize that for now. We'll explain later why that one is true. But anyway, that's a factual limit, the red one in red. But then now, this one that we're looking at here, the limit is theta tends to 0, 1 minus cos theta all over theta. So what they did is they went ahead and used a sneaky trick. They multiplied by this conjugate here on the top and bottom. Um, and, and then when they do that, the numerator becomes 1 minus cos squared theta, and the denominator just becomes theta times this expression. And this numerator, you, by trig identity, 1 minus cosine squared theta is the same as sine squared theta. Then what they did is they actually, to skip a step, they actually changed this sine theta, sine squared theta, into sine theta times sine theta. Then they broke that fraction up into two in the next step. And so they took one of those sine thetas and they stuck it over the theta in the bottom. And then they took the other sine theta and they stuck it over the 1 plus cosine theta in the bottom, which is completely legal. 
because if I actually multiply this step back out, I get sine squared theta on the top, sine theta times sine theta, over theta times 1 plus cos theta on the bottom. Now, they evaluated this limit. They're using limit laws now, right? Because I have two things multiplied together, and if, according to limit laws, we can take the limit of the first one and the limit of the second one and then multiply them. Well, the limit of the first one I just established is 1, that one. The limit of the second one, I can just do direct substitution. If I stick in 0 for sine, I get 0, and then 1 plus cosine of 0 is 2. And so that's how they got the 0 over 2, is for the second half of this limit. So they get 1. So this limit that we're looking at here is equal to 0. So you're going to want to know those limits. Those are limits you're going to use from time to time in a lot of different types of problems, is that one and then this one that we have here now. That's it for this lecture, and we'll have another lecture on Wednesday, most likely.